Uh, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the QMNet series group. Uh, my name is Patrick Law, uh, convening today, and we're lucky to have Stanley Wasserman presenting. Uh, Stan was educated in statistics at the Wharton School at University of Pennsylvania and at Harvard University uh, for his PhD in statistics. He has worked at the National Bureau of Economic Research, Carnegie Mellon University, University of Minnesota, University of Illinois, and Indiana University, where he is now. Uh, for the last 10 years, he has been at, in the Department of Psychological and Brain Science at the, and the Department of Statistics at IU. And uh, today, you'll be talking to us about sensitivity analysis of social networks. Thanks very much, Stanley. OK. Thank you, Patrick. And thank you to all of you who are here this morning. It's, it's evening here in um, Bloomington, Indiana, but um, that's OK. I, I got up one time at, at 3 AM to give a talk in Russia. Um, so this is, not, <laughs> this is not novel to me. I, I was actually supposed to be there, but I was sick and so um i i gave the talk in the days before zoom um um can't remember what software we used um but nevertheless it worked um i'm going to talk about sensitivity analysis um this is um it still remains a, a hot topic in network analysis um, this is work that I've been doing with Doug Steinle, who was a graduate student um, at Illinois when I was at Illinois. He's now at University of Missouri. So um, the primary here we go. Primary research questions here are. What are the effects and implications of measurement error on social networks or networks in general? What can be done to control for lack of independence of interaction measurements taken on the respondents, um, which certainly is the case when one has eco-centered networks? Um, there's been um, continued growth in network analysis but I think a lot of the growth has come from people who are studying ego-centered networks. Um, um, ego gives information about alters, and then there's another ego over here that gives the same information. And one usually assumes that the egos, the respondents, are um, indeed um, a, a sample from a population of, of respondents. Um, but clearly the alters the information given by ego um there is a definite lack of independence of these measurements and in general what can we say about resist resistance and robustness of social network analysis um if anything can be said um initial research focus um applications to policy issues. Um, this is what started um, Doug and myself working on this area. Um, study and expansion of standard methodology to methodology that is a little more robust, a little resistant to yucky network data. And a study of the effects of measurement error in a variety of different forms on standard analyses. So that's the direction um, that this research um, initially was headed in. We've done more stuff, although I'm not going to report on it today. Um, um, and it hasn't been, none of this has really been written up yet. So um, except for the initial work, um, which was done about 10 years ago um, on this stuff. First of all, and I need this in order to talk about distributions that I'm going to use to, um, to study networks, I'm going to let capital N denote a single set of nodes and a set of lines. Um, I should um, 
say, first of all, that I'm going to assume you all know something about networks. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about notation or concepts, but I think that since this is QM net, um, the net should um, dominate. And um, so these notions that I'm going to talk about today, I think probably are familiar to you all. Um, the single set of nodes, um, the nodes are labeled one through G. Um, this denotes the set of actors and a particular relation defined on the actors will be denoted by X. Um, okay. Um, this relation can be represented by a G by G matrix. And to keep things simple um, today, I'm going to talk about a situation where the entries in X are dichotomous. So either um, a relational tie exists between from I to J, where I and J denote particular nodes, or it doesn't exist. X I J equals just one or zero. So um, we are in the world of dichotomous or binary entries. Um, okay. I have found that um, to talk about distributions for networks, um, the best way to do it is via a dependence graph. Um, dependence graphs are the starting points for the Hammersley Clifford theorem, which um, many people have written about, but I will point you to a paper by um, Julian Bieshag in 1974, which was in the Journal of the Royal Statistical Society, which defines a probability distribution for the postulated dependence graph. The exact form of this graph depends on the nature of the substantive hypotheses that are under study. So, um, one can postulate that relational ties emanating from a particular individual are all associated, or for example, um, that I's choice or non-choice of J is dependent on J's um, choice or non-choice of I. There are many different um, theories that can be applied to this situation. Um, but clearly, the entries in X cannot be assumed to be independent. The dependent structure is determined by the dependence graph. And the nodes of the dependence graph are actually the relational ties. So there are links in the dependence graph between relational ties that are assumed to be dependent on each other. Um, so that defines, as my notes say here on this page, um, the nodes that are in the dependence graph. If I and J are both in, the set n, um, i not equaling j, then it's a possible entry in the dependence graph. The edges of the dependence graph, as I just mentioned, signify pairs of random variables that are assumed to be conditionally dependent. Conditionally dependent given the values of all other random variables. Um, the specific dependence graph this thing um, can also be viewed as what's called an independence graph, where the ties um, link nodes that are independent of each other. And as I've learned this past couple of months, this is really at the heart and soul of causal dependence um, in statistical theory. These concepts and definitions can be extended to multi-relational networks. 
So you may have more than one X and other kinds of networks where the network itself may be, um, the ties may be valued or signed. Um, all of this is extendable to um, more complicated network structures. I'm gonna keep things simple today and define things as dichotomous. Um, distributions for univariate graphs and associated two-way binary arrays, several well-known classes of distributions may be specified in terms of the structure of the dependence graph. Um, three major classes of these distributions are Bernoulli graphs and conditional uniform graph distributions, dyadic dependence distributions. Um, the most common one is known as P1 and P star, which um, several people refer to as an ergum, exponential random graph model. Um, in the literature, it was first called P star, so I like to stick to um, the priority in the literature. Um, and it's really not an exponential distribution, it's an exponential family of distributions. So properly speaking, um, ergums really are exponential families of random graph distributions. Um, the simplest kind of distribution is that of a Bernoulli graph. And um, it's the distribution that um, is most commonly used by physicists and computer science scientists in the study of networks. Um, the assumption of conditional independence for all pairs of random variables representing distinct relational ties. So everything is independent of everything else. This leads to the class of Bernoulli graphs. Um, a Bernoulli graph assumes complete independence of the relational ties. There are actually no ties in the dependence graph. Um, if the probability of relational tie is a half, like flipping a fair coin, the distribution is usually um, commonly referred to as a uniform random graph or directed graph. Um, usually directed graphs are abbreviated digraphs distribution. Um, the physicists call this the completely random distribution or the random graph. But what it is, is of course, a Bernoulli graph, and there are many more complicated graphs, distributions that one can look at. Um, the uniform distribution U um, conditions on no graph properties. The uniform distribution U given L conditions on the number L of edges in the graph. All digraphs with a specific value of L are equally likely. If a digraph does not have L equal to L, then it has probability zero in the big scheme of things. So we may want to condition on, for example, um, observing 15 ties. If a graph has more than 15 or less than 15, um, it's assumed to have probability zero. Um, I like to think of a big urn um, of distributions, I guess. I'm too much of a statistician here. Um, and you've thrown out all the graphs, all the digraphs that don't have exactly the number of lines that one is conditioning on. There are many other conditional uniform distributions, and I could spend hours talking about them. One very common one is U given M, A, and N. Um, M, the number of mutuals, A, the number of asymmetrics, and N, the number of null dyads. Um, this distribution, um, M, A, and N, is often referred to as the dyad census in the literature. This distribution is used 
in the study of triples or triads, um, threesomes, and obviously in the study of things like transitivity and clusterability. Um, and there's a large literature on this um, going back to the 60s or 70s. Um, yeah, I think that's when the U given MANN distribution first appeared. Um, the assumption of conditional independence, conditional dependence of Xij and Xkl leads to a class of dyad dependence models. These distributions assume that all dyads are statistically independent, but the states of any specific dyad are not. So dyads, when the graph is directed, when you have a digraph, um, dyads can be in one of three states, the mutual state where both ties are present, asymmetric state where only one tie is present, and null dyads where there are no ties present. Um, the dependence graph for such distributions has an edge set with edges connecting only the two random variables within each dyad. Okay, because all that matters um, in the scheme of things with respect to um, this class of models is whether or not the tie from I to J is reciprocated, whether or not there is mutuality. Um, this class of models was termed P1 by Hanlon and Leinhardt in the late 70s, early 80s. Um, and it goes without saying that this assumption of independence across dyads is really not realistic, but it was used extensively um, by Hanlon and Leinhardt and by me back in the 70s um, before we got a little more sophisticated in our modeling. P star distributions define general dependence graphs with arbitrary edge sets. Such dependence graphs yield a very general probability distribution for a digraph. And um, I'm talking about P star now. Such distributions belong to a very general exponential family and are often termed exponential family in parentheses random graph models. Um, so the P star framework um, generalizes this dyadic dependence framework and is much more general and um, has led to um, a great number of papers um, in the literature and some books over the last 10 years or so. Um, Okay, now, um, as part of these distributions, there is um, a concern about the connectivity of a network. Um, measures of balance and efficiency can certainly be added to a P-star type model. Also important are centrality, such as actor degree, and structural characteristics such as the prestige of actors. So I'm going to use this distribution theory that I've just talked about to study um, robustness and resistance of network statistics. I'm going to define robustness as how well parameter estimates behave when basic assumptions are violated um, parameter estimates of, for example, P1 or P star models. Um, resistance is usually defined as how well statistics behave when data become messy, full of outliers, or ugly observations. It's um, the sensitivity analysis is, is very common in statistics. Um, I'm going to report this morning on two network sizes, 
um, 10 and 25 hectares. Um, I'm going to fix the density that is the fraction of ties that are actually present. Um, I'm going to allow it to vary from 0 to 0.9 in increments of 1 tenth. Fixing density is equivalent to fixing the number of lines L because to calculate a density, you simply take L divided by the number of possible um, edges that can be present, can be present, and all matrices were generated randomly from this U given L distribution, which um, I should say is a special case of P star for a fixed G. So G is going to be 10 or 25. The appropriate number of ties were randomly assigned to lower triangles of the sociomatrices following the lower triangle, your triangular assignment, the sociomatrices were symmetrized. Um, I'm going to keep this simple today and only talk about digraphs as opposed to graphs. And I generated a thousand sociomatrices, a thousand um, X arrays at random for each of these conditions. So um, I'm going to give you some pictures and talk about the results a little bit. Um, first, for degree cent centralization, the characteristics of degree centralization do not depend on the size of the network, but rather on the density of the network. And this is easily seen by looking at the following figure, where it seems all that matters with respect to degree, this is degree centralization, um, as the density goes from zero up to one. This is for 10 actors, and this is for 25 actors. And as you can see, we have identical shapes of this curve. Um, what matters, obviously, is simply what the overall density is. So that's sort of how I started all of this, how Doug and I started all of this. This is kind of boring. What's not as boring is betweenness centralization. Um, do you all know what betweenness centrality is? It looks at how many geodesics go from one node to another node, and it counts the numbers of nodes that are on the geodesics. You are high in between this centrality if you, meaning your node, is um, on many geodesics. Like to excuse me, like degree centralization, between the centralization is not dependent on the size of the network, but on the density of the network. And you get curves that are not quite as pretty as you do for um, centrality based on degree. This is centrality based on betweenness. And this is for 10 actors. And this is for 25 actors. And I dare say, as the number of actors, the number of nodes increases, the maximum of these curves move, um, moves closer and closer to zero. That's what we have hypothesized here. This is for 25. And notice um, it reaches its peak um, at about 0.1, whereas this one reaches its peak at, oh, somewhere between 0.2 and 0.3 in terms of density. Um, and 
we looked at balance. So balance is um, a slightly more complicated quantity. The results for balance are unlike the results for the other two network statistics, which is not at all surprising. Balance increases as the density increases and an exponential increase occurs when the density is about 0.3. And this is what you find. Balance um, here, I call it triangularity. Triangularity because it's looking at the number of transitive triples, um, which increases exponentially as the density increases. This is for 10 actors. And this curve, which looks very much like the curve for 10 actors is for 25 actors. Okay. Um, so to me, the most interesting part of this is that um, our, this index of tri triangularity um, seems to be independent of the number of nodes in the original graph. This is for 10 and this is for 25. Looks exactly the same. Um, slightly different slope and increase when you are at 25 as opposed to when you are at 10. Um, lastly, efficiency. Um, this measure is equal to one when all of the points are connected and zero when all the points are isolates. So this is the heart and soul of closeness centrality. Um, it really does look at um, how quickly information can be spread in a network. Um, like the other measures, efficiency does not depend on the size of the network, and it looks very much like balance. Um, increasing the density, increasing as the density of the graph increases. And I noted a couple of papers, um, Bienenstock and Bonasich and Borgatti from the early 2000s. But here are the graphs for density as density increases for efficiency for 10 actors and efficiency um, by density for 25 actors. These graphs look similar to each other. They certainly have the same shape, um, but they are different. And my speculation is that as the number of actors continues to increase, one would get exponential increases that probably asymptote at one very quickly. Okay. Um, in a discussion of this, regardless of the network statistic, the measurement is not linearly related to the centrality of the network. Um, none of the measurements are seem to be related to the centrality of the network, which I find very interesting. Um, and it is certainly something that we have looked at um, in more detail. Um, the study of the interactions of network statistics is crucial in determining the overall sensitivity of the network. Um, we need to look at and have looked at more graph statistics. Um, and we have generalized this to directed graphs as well. Um, robustness of models, that is how parameter estimates change as the data change. Um, there have not been that many studies um, but given the usage of P star um, by others, um, this is a topic that needs to be looked at further. 
And I just found a paper, um, Neil and Neil in Psych Methods. Um, I just found it last week. Um, and I should have known about it because I was I'm associate editor for Psych Methods. But nevertheless, this is still a very active area of research. So this is a brand new paper by two individuals at Michigan State University. Um, okay. Well, that's really all I have to say today. Um, I'm certainly interested in any, any questions you all might have. Um, I am here. Um, so I will stop sharing my slides and I will ask, answer any questions that you all might have. Some of you probably know um, the distribution theory. Um, I noticed Pavel down here um, better than I do. Um, nevertheless, um, I will try to answer any questions that you all might have. Yeah, th thanks very much, Stanley. We can we can sure. give you some some digital hand clapping as a as recognition, I think, <laughs> for the for very nice talk. And um, and uh, is anyone like to? Oh, okay. So Johan you, has your hand up already to ask your question. Oh well, thank Sorry. you, uh, Johan. Knows thank you, stuff thank you, Stanley, and, and and good morning or good evening. Hi, Johan. How are you, right, how are you doing? <laughs> Okay. So yeah, so could you uh, so for a clarification? So here you use the conditional model, conditional on density, uh, and, right. and none of the other parameters. Right. So yeah, so all of these graph statistics are are of course um, you know functionally related, many of them. So yeah. yeah, so in terms of empirical analysis using P star or ERGM. Um, so what, what do you think, are, are there any kind of implications to be taken home here for models where you do have parameters for, say, closure or for different types of stars? Well, I think, I think this falls under the heading of robustness. Um, and that is, how do parameter estimates change when data get ugly? Um, and um, I'm not sure there are good answers to that question. Maybe you know of some answers, but I don't know of any right now. Um, I, I have come across more and more papers using the ERGM framework, um, which is good. I mean, it's been popularized, um, but I'm not sure that people fully understand what they're doing when they model with with these with this class of models yeah yeah i can follow up I, I think yeah that's a good point because um the the um, dependence assumption and and hammersley clifford theorem or something that that sort of gets brushed aside and it's uh, it's very crucial yes um yes. so yeah for the, I, I, I don't know the messy the messiness i think and Powell can speak this too that is very hard to combine in an empirical estimable model uh, measurement error and exponential graph models for, yes for for ugly actors we we have a there's a, a paper on on outliers in outlier detection in uh, p star models um, ah. and yeah i can share the link to that um, what's that in jrss or social uh, psychometrica psychometrica yeah okay. i was actually talking about it only yesterday Ah. Because the question was whether people should be looking for outliers or not. Because if they start doing that, they might start doing post hoc uh, adjustments to the models. Right. Uh, but I think, uh, yeah, I think if there's any relevance to my, my initial question, it was, um, so if you, if you do fix density in all of these exercises, then you will never run into these degeneracy issues that you get phase transitions. Um, right. As you, right. as you tweak, tweak yes. the model. Which Gary Robbins told me not to worry about. Oh, yeah. Years ago. <laughs> Gary was a firm believer in, 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 okay, if you have enough parameters in the model, um, the ugliness 
of P star modeling goes away. <laughs> so um, I'm not sure that that's true or not, but um, um, he was a believer in that fact. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Maybe he was referring to the these outcome uh, dependence and social circuit dependence. Yeah. Perhaps. Yes. Yeah. yeah unfortunately, yeah. Gary, Gary's at a wedding today, so he couldn't join. Okay. I should leave the floor to someone else. Other questions? Oh, I can I can ask you a basic one if no one else does. The as uh, I see you so you're using Monte Carlo and there's a thousand matrices being generated. Right. Uh, and I was wondering what the bottleneck there was. I saw, computationally speaking, it's like the the algorithm to simulate you conditioned on L. Is that a mm -hmm. like a quite complicated algorithm, or is that no. or is that not the bottleneck? Okay, that's no. easy. And is it just mainly waiting to calculate these uh, measures of centrality and so on? Is the is the 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 main part that's waiting? Yes, we programmed all of this in R, so it's relatively straightforward to do. Okay. Uh, yeah, Jonathan. Hi, Stanley. Uh, thank you for your talk. Hi. Um, sure. I have a slightly a question that might be out of a bit out of left field since it's a bit more applied but under recognition of uh how the simulation um to me uh the simulations as you showed us t told us how quickly these network statistics can vary depending on the densities of the graph and this is more a question about robustness and data collection but when the data get ugly, would you happen to have any insights regarding the validity of network measurement when we sort of collect network data? Well, the models, the models clearly are only as good as, as um, the data. Mm -hmm. So um, if you don't have a lot of faith in, in the data, if relational ties um, are not measured well, for example, then the models are going to be garbage. So um, it, it really is a garbage in garbage out kind of thing. So um, um, I guess I've been privileged to really only see networks that are nice. But there are plenty of networks out there that are not so nice that are ugly, um, where um, one can't really believe um, the network measurements that one has. So um, these models are complicated as, as Johan has said, and um, um, they probably break down quickly when um, data um, tend to get ugly. And to so sort of it's worth spending spending time in making sure that um, relational ties really are relational ties, um, and that the values, if you have values that are assigned to the relational ties, um, are the right values. And if I may be a bit blunt, is there any way for us to know that? Other, it just seems a bit. Sometimes it feels like surveys might be a bit too far fetched, or some ties are a bit hard to believe. Well, you can you can certainly run the models with with data slightly perturbed, and look at um, what effects that has um, on parameter estimates and other measurements that you might you might be getting from the the models. You can certainly do that yourself. All right, thank you. Sure. Well, if anyone, if no one's going to ask questions, I can I can continue uh, having had my fifteenth <laughs> morning coffee. Um, so, uh, yes, yeah, so one thing I would like you know ask your um, opinion of um, is uh, the kind of standard goodness of fit procedures that we ah. now typically do uh, when when fitting. 
ERGMs or, or P stars. So well, we're doing we're doing a little bit better than the original ideas mm. for goodness of fit, aren't we? Um, and so um, I'm not sure that the software has caught up with the uh, literature yet. Um, you probably know better about that than I do. Um, I've actually been uh, immersed in um, the second edition of um, Wasserman and Faust, which may be Faust and Wasserman. We'll see what Cambridge lets us do um, over the next time interval. That's really what I've been working on for the last year or so. Um, I do have retirement um, now, so um, that's been going relatively smoothly. Mm. Um, yeah. yeah, I think there's the, the I guess the, uh, uh, if I had, you know, if I had to interpret your, the exercises that you did is essentially we, you're looking at um, often global properties of networks and you are yes. fixing some local, well, we call it local, we're fixing some property of network. Yeah. But local is good. Yeah. Right. So I guess mm -hmm. that that is uh, kind of in the spirit of, of these goodness of fit um, checks that you yes. try to find a parsimonious model with uh, that depends on, on, you know, these whatever dependence assumptions you've made and you see, okay, how does that reflect the, uh, the overall structure of the network? Right. Hmm. Right. Okay. So yeah, the fixing, so going on and probing, um, uh, there's a, uh, you remember you, you once wrote, you wrote a paper with uh, Pip and Gary and, and others in, uh, and was published in maybe British Journal of Mathematical Journal Science. of Math, yeah. And, yeah. yeah. And, and right. I think Pip. BJMSP. Right, yeah. And I think Pip referred to that as the, uh, the monster. Oh. And, uh, and, and I think when, when you read that paper, it's, it, you get, you know, the notation is, is pretty, pretty bewildering. Um, but <clears throat> so I don't, no one really followed up with that, but that was kind of an attempt of, of forming a set of um, nested um, conditions or constraints on networks in, in, in a way trying to basically rule out competing explanations in a kind of non-parametric way. Right. And I guess that goes to the heart of how complicated it is to account for these different different structures so yeah we know that the you know centralization is a is a function of say two stars uh, or, mm -hmm. or you know and hubs and and we you know we know that the uh, the higher the centralization the more opportunities there are for closure etc yes so uh, you know we on the one hand you might want to do it in the strict way with non-parametric approaches mm -hmm. or you will try or you, you try to do it using a, a kind of a parametric approach uh, say the exponential random growth model i don't know if there are any kind of relations to that and whatever happened to the, the monster i the monster got published and and we didn't work on it anymore so i don't know what happened to it mm. yeah yeah but i agree with you that it was a monster paper Yep. Hi. Uh, in the chat, there was a message from Sue Finch. Pip was also unable to come today, but says hi to Stanley. Ah, well, that's lovely. <laughs> Has she retired back to Melbourne or is she still in Sydney? Do any of you know? She's, she's still in Sydney, Stanley. She she's actually spent the last three months in, in Melbourne, but um, has just gone back okay. to Sydney. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But she's going to retire too soon. Yes. I don't know. <laughs> I can't. You don't know. <laughs> yep. Okay. Well, tell her hi for me. I will. Yeah. Yep. Do that. Well, perhaps. Uh, Perhaps we can end the recording and, and then if there's still some, still plenty of time to chat if, if people would like. And before I end though, maybe I'll just say 
thank you one last time, Stanley, for coming late at night to talk to us. You're welcome. And, uh, Not late, but <laughs> we appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you very much.